Hey, hey, hey! Now, this video, there is a lot to talk about, and I've been waiting to make this video for a while now, and I really hope this is true, but Monolith Soft may have finally been able to get the rights to Xenosaga from Bandai Namco. They may have bought it off of them or something, and this could be very huge for the future of xenoblade and just the entire series of xeno as a whole now before we actually get into it for those of you who don't know about xenosaga who don't know what xenosaga is or just need a refresher and how all of this could play into xenoblade and everything um i'm kind of gonna have to give a quick summary of the entire Xeno series as a whole and how Xeno Saga is relevant so for those of you who already know about Xeno Saga and whatever or don't want to hear this part you can just skip to this timestamp to get to the main topic of the video but I'm just gonna give a quick summary of the Xeno series and how Xeno Saga fits in so originally the year I don't quite remember back in the 19 90s i'm pretty sure 90s or 80s somewhere around there tatsuya takahashi the creator of xeno was working at square at the time and that is when he created xeno gears um you know to start off the series the very first game of the series is xeno gears and the fucked up thing is that square told Takahashi that if Xenogears sold 1 million copies they would green light for a sequel but unfortunately it only sold 900,000 copies and no sequel was you know given the okay to be made so Xenosaga and Xenoblade could never have even existed and I might not even be making this video right now if Xenogears just sold 100,000 more copies they're 90% of the way there what a tragedy but uh xeno gears was part five to a six part story which i'll be calling perfect works now when i say perfect works in japan there was an art book for xeno gears called perfect works and in the art book there was a timeline of the entire xeno gears story with xeno gears taking place as episode five out of six so there's six parts and Xenogears was part five. After uh, Xenogears basically failed in all sense of the word, uh, Takahashi was like, you know what? Fuck y'all square. He left and founded his own company along with some of the employees from Square, founded his own company called Monolith Soft, where they were then bought by Bandai Namco, which in their very first game was Xenosaga. Now, Xeno Saga, again, was a retelling of this Perfect Works sort story. And when I say Perfect Works, I'm referring to the timeline, because that's just generally what the fandom has come in agreement to call it. So when I say Perfect Works, I'm talking about the timeline and not the actual art book itself. But Xeno Saga uh, was going to be a retelling of Perfect Works because Takashi still wanted to tell that story and he wasn't able to at Square, so he thought he'd be able to with his own company, uh, Monolith Soft. So he started retelling the Perfect Works story, this time from episode one. And Xeno Saga, just like Xeno Gears, was going to be a six part series. And Xeno Saga episode one was going to be starting off as episode one of Perfect Works. But eventually, as time went on, it was becoming more and more clear that the series was starting to fail, and with each subsequent release, they sold less and less copies, with Xenosaga 3 being the final game in the series as of now. And it's the rarest because it sold the least and had the least amount of copies um, printed. Which is why it's so expensive, and I, you know, got all the games xenosaga 3 especially cost me like 250 dollars so i mean it's worth it for me but it's 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 tough it definitely hurt the bank account but um xenosaga 
unfortunately only halfway done and stopped at episode three out of six possible episodes and after the commercial failure of xenosaga uh monolith soft was bought out by nintendo in 2007 and with the failure of failure of xenosaga takahashi decided you know why not create a brand new game to kind of boost morale after the failure of xenosaga so they started working on a brand new game called monado beginning of the world and around this time is when the great absolute goatee legend best president nintendo's ever had sotaro iwata came up to takahashi and said hey why not make this a xeno game not only to pay homage and um basically it's like a callback and what's the word i'm looking for pay homage and respect i can't think of the word i might come back to it later but respect the legacy of xeno but also the legacy of takahashi and his work throughout the series so monolith soft started reworking the game into a xeno game which we now know became xenoblade chronicles and originally it was a japan only game but there was so much fan support for it and people basically outcrying that they wanted the game they started a movement called Operation Rainfall to get the game localized and released worldwide, which was successful, and we got Xenoblade Chronicles on the Wii in 2010. And since 2000 is 2010, the Wii was at the end of its lifespan, so a game coming out at the very end of console's lifespan, not many people are going to know about the game so the first xenoblade game was still relatively a gem even though it's successful it was still very niche and it was just successful enough that monolith was able to create another game in the series called xenoblade chronicles x now x is a very weird game in the series it's will probably forever be the black sheep of the series unless we get more x games because it is just so vastly different than what Xenoblade 1 did and even now vastly different than 2 and 3 is like its own spin-off type of thing it's not really a spin-off but it might as well be it also came out on the Wii U which didn't really sell too many copies at that and then the, the few people who had a Wii U even fewer had Xenoblade X so it was a very very obscure game in the grand scheme of things Fuck yeah, dude, and too. the xenoblade one and x sold well enough to where yeah. they started work called xenoblade chronicles 2 for the nintendo switch releasing in 2017 same year as the switch when it didn't really have too many titles so this one was fairly successful for the Switch itself, but also for the series, thanks to what I like to call Switch treatment, where most games that come to the Switch just all automatically sell very well and are really successful. Even ports, uh, some ports tend to outsell the original copies. So a lot of games that come to the Switch just happen to do very well because switch is a very popular console especially back then near release so a lot of people had switches so naturally a lot of people would hear about the game xenoblade chronicles 2 and want to try it out which is how i found out about the series xenoblade 2 that's how i found out or like got into the series i knew about xenoblade 1 through you know shulk being in smash and whatever so that's how i knew about xenoblade but i got into the series thanks to 2 and therefore 2 is my favorite Xenoblade game and currently my favorite game of all time. But with the huge success of Xenoblade 2, Monolith Soft decided to, you know, remaster the first game and, you know, bring it to Switch, which also did very well. And around the time they finished working on Xenoblade 2, they immediately started working on Xenoblade 3. And as we know, Xenoblade 3 also was a huge success, and here we are now. Uh, so how that all ties into everything, I kind of just gave a brief explanation of this whole series and just a brief summary. I 
may have left out a couple details but they're not that important you want like an in-depth summary of the series there's plenty of other videos out there by other people that can go more in depth about it i just wanted to kick give a quick summary to kind of like catch you up to how xenosaga is important here and naturally as we know xenosaga the ip is owned by bandai namco so monolith can't really do anything with the ip even if they wanted to they can only you know throw in a couple references or whatever which is what they did with xenoblade 2 with cosmos and telos being in xenoblade 2 as rare blades cosmos and telos obviously being characters from xenosaga now how the topic of this video comes in and why i think they may have actually gotten the rights to xenosaga is very interesting and the more i talk about it and the more you think about it it gets me really really hyped that this could all be possible and just the possibilities of the future of this series and it's all thanks to this game right here xenoblade chronicles 3 future Dream that just released a couple days ago almost a week ago this game is phenomenal and it wraps up the Klaus saga of Xenoblade, you know, wraps up the story of Klaus and brings the series to a close from Xenoblade 1, 2, and 3. This is like the big crossover and just like culmination of the entire series in one game. And obviously there are going to be spoilers for Xenosaga and uh, Future Redeemed in this video. So if you don't want any spoilers, now is your time to leave. But at the end, near the end of Future Redeemed in the cutscene called Niall's Dream, there is a radio that plays while Matthew and Niall are talking to each other. And there are subtitles at the top of the screen, you know, for the radio while the character subtitles are at the bottom. Monolith purposely put these subtitles up at the screen so we would see what the radio is saying and they put it at the top clear for us to see. In here, we get very we get a couple of references that are huge first we get a reference to project exodus we get a reference to project exodus from xenoblade x now this is not really important to the video but i just thought i'd point it out because it is a nice reference project exodus in xenoblade x was basically the project to um also I don't know how I forgot this, but spoilers for Xenoblade X uh, in this video too, because this reference to explain what it means, I kind of have to spoil the game. So spoilers for X, Xenoblade X, Xenosaga, uh, specifically three, and um, Future Redeemed. But Project Exodus was basically this massive project to build a bunch of arcs, basically giant uh, like spaceships, in order to uh set humanity out in this space for to look for a new planet to call home because elma came to earth with the information of skulls and arcs and everything as well as the information that there would be a war above earth where earth would eventually be destroyed from that war and that war was against the ghosts and the ganglion and earth was destroyed from the ghost ships crashing into the planet and since the ghosts were antimatter, caused all these explosions, eventually destroying Earth. So Elma warned humanity about this. So they got to work on Project Exodus to build all these arcs to load as many people on it as they can to fly out in space and find new planets called home. Unfortunately, only 3 million people were able to leave Earth. The capacity for the arcs, 3 million people altogether. As you know, that is nowhere near enough assuming the population is you know equal to ours in real life that was seven almost eight billion people at the time seven billion people on the planet three million that's a very very small percentage so a lot of people didn't go most people did not make it the mo many people who did make it most of the people were just like high ranking government officials and important wealthy rich people so a lot of uh middle and low class people were left behind which is part of 
um, Lao's motivation for his character, the reason he betrayed humanity and sided with the Ganglion because he thought humanity was greedy and selfish, allow only allowing rich people on the Ark ships, which is how his wife and his daughter died. They were left back on Earth because they weren't uh, granted, I guess, a seat, you know, a space on the Ark ship, the White Whale, which is um, the Ark ship that the party came on and an LA was in. His wife and daughter weren't able to make it on the White Whale while he was because he was a... I'm pretty sure he was um, an important part to the whole Project Exodus thing. I don't remember exactly, but um, he held resentment towards humanity for not letting his daughter and wife on the ship. But, um, yeah, that's not really all that important. Basically, Project Exodus was building these arc ships for humanity to set out and find life on new planets. Now, where the Xenosaga stuff comes in, a very important person in Xenosaga 3, to be exact, was named Drop Dmitry Yuryev of the Minos Authority. Dmitry Yuryev is a very important in antagonist in Xenosaga 3 specifically, and his main goal is to basically destroy Udu. So naturally, he was um, seeking out the Zohar and using the Zohar to defeat Udu. Um, I'm not, I don't know the specifics, but he is a major antagonist in Xenosaga 3. Also, at the very, before we even get to that, the radio that all of this was playing on and that these references were mentioned on the very on the radio there was the vector industries logo right there in the middle of the radio vector industries is a company one of the major companies in xenosaga and it's the company that shion uzuki the protagonist works for and where the cosmos project took place and you know building cosmos who's anti-gnosis weapon she's basically an android to combat the gnosis who are in most simplest terms gnosis are basically ghosts uh, they are the basically the manifestations of people's souls who rejected to join the collective unconscious and they became gnosis and they reside in the imaginary number domain so they can't be harmed by humans or anything in the real number domain so like in our dimension so cosmos was created and outfitted with the hilbert effect that would draw them into the real number domain in order for them to be damaged so vector industries is a very very important part of xenosaga lore and a very big player in the story and right here in future deem this radio has the vector industry symbol on it now if you didn't think that was enough the very very last cutscene of future deemed shows this shot where you see a view of earth which is the combined worlds of xenoblade 1 and 2 coming back together so a lot of those people a lot of people who were disappointed with threes um ending this kind of remedies that that's not i'm not going to talk about that here that can be a whole video in its own but we see this shot of earth and then look up in the top right corner we see this blue twinkling light falling towards earth this is very intentional considering this cutscene is playing for so long and it's very easy to notice this and that's all that's playing and this is very very similar to the ending of xenosaga 3 where we see cosmos's destroyed body floating through space towards an earth-like planet most likely lost jerusalem which is basically like the first earth and this is unrelated but kind of just a nice detail that kind of solidifies this even more is that you can kind of see what looks like a space elevator coming out of the planet which could just be a beanstalk leading up to Radamanthus. not too important but a nice little detail to note so these two cutscenes are very 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 similar and it's obviously you know on purpose this isn't just a coincidence monolith soft pays very close attention to everything they do and this for this being the very final cutscene in the entire game 
it's obviously meaningful and they want us to remember this part and pay close attention to it it looks very very similar to the xenosaga 3 ending now what does all this have to do with anything you could just say oh these are just references uh to xenosaga in the game you know they have already done this before with xenoblade 2 literally having cosmos and telos in the game although these aren't the same cosmos and telos these are non-canon they're completely two different you know cosmos and telos not that that really matters but it's literally the two characters in the game right there it could just be a reference just like that now that would make sense but the one one detail that kind of flips that on its head and even kind of just inspired this whole video in and of itself is in the credits of future redeemed we can see there's a special thanks to bandai namco now you could say they're just thanking them for letting them reference the you know xenosaga in this game and that's what i thought at first as well but if you go and look at the credits for xenoblade 2 under the special thanks bandai namco is not there so even though they used telos and cosmos obviously from xenosaga they did not thank bandai namco but in future Dean, they are thinking bandai namco and these uh references are kind of like fitting in with the lore of xenoblade now because uh in niall's dream this cutscene takes place kind of in like not really a flashback but like a recreation of klaus's world which was the world you know what earth was like before klaus used the zohar to reset the universe this is what it was like so this is in universe actual canon stuff right here of you know klaus's world well they're talking about dmitry yuriev and you got the vector symbol so dmitry yuriev and vector are canon to the world that's not just some reference they throw in as kind of just like oh a neat little reference that's like in universe canon stuff right there if the you know the radio had the vector uh logo and that was it then i guess you could say oh that's just a reference nice little reference they put on there but Dmitry Yuryev being name dropped there like in the actual world that's not really too much of a coincidence so that paired with them showing possibly Xenosaga 3's ending at the very end cutscene why would they just throw that up in there that has nothing to do with the Xenoblade at all nothing in Xenoblade even remotely relates to that something falling towards earth why would that be there unless they're trying to incorporate xenosaga into xenoblade now and make xenosaga canon and how else would they do that unless they finally have the rights to xenosaga and are building on top of it so the special thanks in the credits could then be you know thanking bandai namco for allowing them to have the rights now you know selling the rights to them of you know xenosaga so this could mean a whole lot of something or a whole lot of nothing we could i could just be looking way too deep into this or this could actually be uh monolith thanking bandai for selling them the rights to xenosaga because why would they be referencing xenosaga this hard not only in that cutscene but the very ending cutscene of the game and if you remember takahashi said i don't remember exactly where but Takahashi said that Future Redeemed will give us a pretty good idea of the future of Xenoblade as a whole, considering this is the final wave to the final game so far. So the very last cutscene and the very last game, that's obviously going to be important. And he says hinting at the future of Xenoblade. And this is very reminiscent of, you know, the ending of Xenosaga meaning that xenosaga somehow has some importance to the future of xenoblade so perhaps they're starting to like make xenosaga canon and start incorporating xenosaga into xenoblade now and connecting those two series and the only way they'd be able to do that is if they were able to use xenosaga assets and have the rights to xenosaga so it's very possible that they finally got the rights to Xenosaga and this this gives us so much hope 
and it would actually make sense that they would have it too because we've seen how popular xenoblade has been lately it's just getting more and more popular as time goes on and xenoblade is kind of at the height of its popularity right now and obviously monolith soft's going to want to build on top of that and continue making more xenoblade related games merch or whatever else so perhaps they made enough money from xenoblade in order to make a deal with bandai namco to let you know have bandai sell the rights to xenosaga to them so they might have made enough money to buy the rights of xenosaga and actually able to do stuff with it now which just gets me so excited because this could mean we could either get a xenosaga trilogy remaster or finally xenosaga 4 and takahashi finally continue the story of xenosaga like it originally was supposed to now the more likely option would be a xenosaga remaster because if they just popped out with xenosaga 4 a lot of people a lot of the people in the xenoblade um you know people who like xenoblade aren't into the franchise like that and they just enjoy the games and they have no idea what xenosaga is so if they see a xenosaga 4 like wait what happened to xenosaga 1 2 and 3 and they wouldn't really have a way to catch up with the story because the games aren't you know that cheap to get physically unless you want to emulate i'm not a fan of emulating so i prefer the physical copies and i'm sure a lot of people are like that as well so the only other way to experience the story is watching playthroughs or reading the wiki and i'm a lot of people don't really have the time to do that so the best way to catch everybody up on xenosaga would to be to remaster the other three games and make them more accessible and then once that does pretty well and on top of the money they're making from xenoblade uh they could finally go in and make xenosaga 4 and then hopefully eventually five and six and complete the xenosaga story or they could just incorporate a lot of xenosaga stuff into xenoblade and tell a lot of the untold details and you know continue four five and six in xenoblade they can incorporate a lot of the details and themes and whatever from four five and six into xenoblade and kind of just tell one bigger story combining blade and saga together so as you can see there's many 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 possibilities of what they could do with this hopefully this is the case and and this is actually seems more likely that we will eventually get a xenosaga trilogy remaster now that you know xenoblade is more popular than ever there originally was going to be a xenosaga remaster back in 2019 uh there was an interview with bandai namco where bandai namco themselves confirmed that they were thinking about doing a xenosaga remaster but decided to scrap it because of profitability issues they felt like if they did a remaster of xenosaga they would not have you know they wouldn't sell enough in order to profit off of it since the fan base of xenosaga was too small and it wouldn't make up for however much they made you know however much they it cost them to make the game so they felt like they're they wouldn't make enough money to profit off of the game if they did a remaster so but they were even you know they were thinking about doing it now that xenoblade is more popular than ever meaning a lot more people who are getting into xenoblade are finding out about saga and gears bringing more attention to xenosaga and even a couple weeks ago there was a tweet sent out by a company who focuses on basically like refurbishing old mobile games and like re-releasing them and the overwhelming majority of replies were of xenosaga pied piper the majority of replies on that tweet was just pied piper pied piper pied piper even i you know did my part in it too so we could see an actual just official release of xenosaga pied piper and be able to play it for the first time pied piper is kind of like a spin-off game that tells the backstory of ziggy but it was only accessible on very 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 old japanese phones that are obviously defunct now so there's absolutely no way to play it at all 
but this could be our chance to finally play Pied Piper for ourselves for the very first time. So Xenosaga has been gaining a lot of traction lately more than ever with that and then the popularity of Xenoblade pouring over into Gears and Saga. Xenosaga is kind of at the height of its popularity as well. So with the amount of money uh, Monolith Soft is making with Xenoblade, they could put that into um, a Xenosaga remaster and while working on more Xenoblade games because they they have the power to do that. If you remember, uh, Xenoblade 2 was kind of unfinished and rushed because most of the staff at Monolith was help, helping work on uh, Breath of the Wild, so they didn't have too many people working on Xenoblade 2. And then they finally had the full company working on um, Xenoblade 3, which was a lot more like polished and finished game. And even now, they have more employees than they did back then in 2017, 16, 15, when they were making Xenoblade 2 and having to split that up with Breath of the Wild. Now they have the full team. They could split like half of the company to work on a Xenosaga trilogy or Saga 4, and then the other half working on Xenoblade 4 or Xenoblade X2 or whatever else. So it's very possible that a Xenosaga saga trilogy or saga 4 you know is coming very soon or just anything with the xeno saga we could finally see more xeno saga uh content games whatever now that monolith soft very likely owns the rights to now and they could have just bought it out and not have said anything and wanted to keep this private to kind of surprise fans once they pop out with an announcement of a trilogy remaster or saga 4 or whatever as kind of like a hey look we finally got it and kind of just like a surprise to the fans as kind of a like a thank you for supporting the xenoblade series and saga or whatever so i'm very excited hopefully we see more xenosaga and it's one step closer to the entire series being interconnected because we still have xeno gears that we can't that monolith can't really do anything with because the rights of it is owned to square and we all know square enix they're a very stubborn and bitchy company for xenogears what 25th anniversary they made some merch but that's really about it they still have yet to remaster it re-release even acknowledge it at all there's a couple of like xenosaga or xenogears uh character cameos and their other games like i think Faye is in one of their fighting games i don't remember but they refuse to do anything with it just letting it sit there and collect dust which is very tragic but if monolith finally was able to buy the rights to xeno saga maybe perhaps someday down the line they're able to buy um xeno gears because monolith soft is a very very important subsidiary to um a very important subsidiary to Nintendo because not only did they help with Breath of the Wild, they helped with Animal Crossing New Horizons, which also is was a very, very, very successful game, one of the best selling Switch games of all time. The best, definitely the best selling Animal Crossing game. They also helped work on Splatoon 3, the best selling Splatoon game, and which also was the highest selling Switch game or like video game of all time in Japan when it first launched so monolith soft is very very important subsidiary to nintendo and they've helped on a lot of their big projects so it would make sense that nintendo would want to basically treat monolith soft well and keep them around so i i don't doubt they would want to help monolith get the rights to xenosaga or gears to help create more games because that's just more money for nintendo so everything just leads to it and everything just falls together nicely and points towards monolith soft finally having the rights to xenosaga i could go on all day about this and all the possibilities and more stuff about how and just it's, it's great I, if you can't tell i'm very excited for this xenosaga is a phenomenal series that is criminally criminally underrated i haven't finished the series myself yet but from what i have played this series is absolutely phenomenal and i actually like some aspects of it more than xenoblade so i really hope we finally get to see a revival and continuation of xenosaga and perhaps 
someday down the line Xeno Gears gets thrown up into it as well and then the entire Xeno series is finally interconnected like it should be so yeah there's I mean that's that's basically it as kind of like a recap the Xeno Saga uh, references with the Dimitri area vector and then the Xeno Saga 3 ending obviously those all mean something they're not just going to throw those in there just like a hey look we're referencing Xeno Saga why would they want to be referencing Xeno Saga if they're not planning to do something with Xeno Saga uh, Monolith typically likes to hint at their next projects in the previous ones so like Future Connected you know the side story for Xenoblade DE um, was hinting towards Xenoblade 3 and it was kind of like hinting towards the future of Xenoblade which became Xenoblade 3 so they could very well be doing that exact same thing with Future Redeem with all these Xenosaga references they could be you know hinting at a brand new Xenosaga project coming up so the future for Xenoblade and Saga and just Xeno as a whole is looking very bright right now considering this is the most popular and successful it's ever been so it makes sense they'd want to capitalize on that so here's the whole thing monolith finally did get the rights to xeno saga and i'm not just overlooking it but um yeah that's really about it i'm very excited for what is going to happen with this series and i'm just loving this series more and more every day so I will eventually finish Xeno Saga after I get all these future Redeem videos out that I want to make. I'll continue the Xeno Saga playthrough, so I won't have to wait long for that. But finally, it's done. I went on for half an hour just talking about this. It just shows how excited I am for this and how much I want it to happen. I'm getting really bad tinnitus right now, but that's really about it. So, as always, thanks for watching. Have a damn good day. Stay safe. Be well and play some goddamn Xenoblade!